happy Saturday to everybody. It's Dave here. And to my, what would be left, is the man, the myth, the legend, the one from Kick-Ass Blog and Grant's Tomb, Mr. Darren Campbell. How you doing, Darren? Pretty good, Dave. Yourself? I am doing real good. Hey, Quang's Excellent. joined us already. How you doing, Quang? Hey, Quang. Let's go, baby. Have we got a show for you? Darren gave me the agenda today, and it's packed full of stuff. Don't know exactly what he wants to talk about when he gets to it, but we'll get there. Anyways, shall we start? Absolutely, Dave. Lead the way. Changing the screen up, because I got everything oh, yeah. loaded. Your first topic was to talk about Cook. Shall Dalvin Cook, should, not shall, should Dalvin Cook play this Sunday? He is listed as questionable. He is. He has been listed as questionable. I think that's the third straight week he's been questionable. Didn't play against Seattle. Did play against um, the Browns last weekend. And... Um, wasn't as didn't look effective. Him, didn't, didn't look him. No, he didn't look himself. He looked a, not quite as explosive. Maybe we maybe we we imagine that because we know he's got an ankle injury that's bothering him. Uh, he admitted he's not a hundred percent. No shit, Dalvin. <laughs> 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 you, you got your ankle twisted up pretty good against the, uh, you know, the against the uh, Seattle or not Seattle, but the, the week before that. Uh, wow. that. That is going to uh, that's going to affect you, but. Uh, yeah, should he play? Will he play? I think uh, it. Last week the Vikings did decide to roll the dice and play him, as we mentioned. Mm -hmm. Didn't look; it wasn't very effective. The Browns' defense had a lot to do with that, but I think he lacked a little bit of the, the explosiveness that we have come to expect from him. I would not play Dalvin Cook tomorrow, even if he could go. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, and one of them is the stats you're posting up mm -hmm. is just. Uh, I mean, I think uh, my eyesight isn't that great, but uh, but uh, you know, let's get this out of the way now. Dalvin Cook is a better running back than Alexander Madison. There's no, I'm not arguing that for Nobody the would most argue part. That. Yes, Nobody would argue that. Um, people have argued that the, the Vikings' defense is different with cook than it is with madison um is different worse i i don't know but when madison is in the game his career stats over three years is there's not really a big drop off in production madison runs hard he's got like a 4.5 well i got i'm plus, showing 4.4 yards per average yeah. versus 4.7 yeah. for dalvin uh, he's the difference is in reception yards. He's 9.3 versus 8.5. But when it comes to touchdowns, his percentage of getting touchdowns per play is way lower than Dalvin's. He doesn't have that explosive take-it-to-the-house ability that Dalvin does. He's the type that you got to get lathered up throughout the game and the pounding and the pounding to get going. Um to bust some, you know, 25 yarders or whatever. Yeah, the the home run now mind you Madison has not played had nearly as many carries as, as oh, Cook has had over his over his career but uh still uh, Madison has had gotten a, a fair fair number of carries in the 3 years considering he's he's a backup to Dalvin Cook but his longest run ever is 35 a 35 yard run. Well Dalvin Cook has a, one of those runs probably probably every other game and he's he has at least one or two runs usually more in the season that are way longer than that. So yes, the home run threat is is not there when Madison is in the game, but he's a quality back in the three games that he has started for Madison. He's uh, the, the Vikings are two and one in those games. And the one they lost was the Atlanta game, which we're going to talk a little bit. bit I'm going to hey mention there, a little bit. Was, was the uh, Charles was the Atlanta game. They got, Mm -hmm. uh, there was a bunch of uh, we got boat raced in that game. Had to abandon the run early. The Atlanta we game last back. year, where we yeah, got yeah, smoked Atlanta game last. So, yeah. I just think that you can against Detroit, who are zero four. Maybe they're not 
uh, the Tampa Bay 1976 Tampa Bay Bucks bad, but they're not a very good football team. They don't have a lot of studs on defense. They have had trouble stopping the run all year, just like the Vikings have. I think that, and I think Thank Madison, you, you can, you can get, you can have a very effective offense Welcome with Madison the show, in the game. Mm-hmm. Judith should not play. So Judith is in agreement with me, but I really think that the Vikings can still get, uh, be effective enough to be, to move the ball on, on this Detroit defense without Dalvin cook. And I know that, uh, you know, you're, it's hard to say this, you don't want to look ahead and I'm, and in the NFL, the most important game is the game you're playing, of course, right. but really next week we go on the road against Carolina say you're two and three in that uh that if you give dalvin cook a week of rest recognizing that he basically played about half the game last week and didn't take as many hits as he normally would and he didn't play the week before you give him an extra week of rest he didn't practice this week at all maybe you're going to need dalvin cook against the panthers who have a much better defense than the detroit lions even if you're not playing him as much as normal having him in like say half the game or three quarters of the game you need him against the Panthers to beat the Panthers. I don't think you need Dalvin Cook there this week, especially a, an 80% Dalvin Cook, to beat the Lions, or at least to have your offense play the way they need to play to score enough points to beat the Lions. Right. That's why. That's this... why I think Madison is is an easy play in this game. Um, but I don't think that Zimmer agrees with me. <laughs> well, and and. The... Proof positive of that was the Seattle game, right? Matt, uh, Cook was out. Madison played. Madison had a great game. I think it was 172 combined yards, right? And the offense hummed just perfectly. Um, maybe even a little bit better in that game. And just like just like the offense hummed in that final game against Detroit last year on the road when Madison played and Cook did not play. Yep. Uh, Different situation because Detroit kind of had checked out in that game, and but I, I, you know, you would think the last game of the year, both teams didn't have anything to play for. But Madison Alexander, the offense was smoking uh, good in that game too, and Madison was a big reason why. Mm-hmm. Hey, James, you are correct. We need a division win, and that's what we're talking about. We should get one hopefully tomorrow. Um. There's a few things on the stats that I found interesting comparing the two. Yes, uh, Dalvin Cook has twice as many carries as or more. Uh, Madison has a third, but he's the second string back, so you would think so. Um, We talked about the yards per play average where Madison outnumbers him on the pass. You know, and that's relatively small sample sizes, but that happens to be a fact. What is interesting is availability. The one thing that Cook has always had is he can't play a full season. He has always been injured. He is only available about two-thirds of the season. So if he's available for two-thirds, I want it down when the games get a little bit tougher than what tomorrow should be. Um <laughs> Keyword should be. We know be. it's the Lions and anything can happen with this team and that team. So, um, whereas Madison is more healthy, he's been available at a possible availability. He's in the 83 percentile. Um, of all the games he could have played, whether he was on the roster or not, he's 83.33%, whereas Dalvin is 67.33%. Six five, right? I thought that was interesting. And, Good stats there, Dave. Yes. And the catch percentage, Madison's the better catcher. He's caught eighty three point eighty versus seventy nine point eighty. Uh, both are good percentages. They're not wide receivers, but they're good for running backs. So we have two good running backs. If you play Dalvin tomorrow, you're probably going to have to tape up his ankle. Right, we played back in the day so many times. Um, hey there, Mary. Mary. Um, that 
<laughs> taping up the ankle, generally, yes, you can play on it, but it does slow you down because it's not as mobile, um, and you lose that explosion. GMAC, you guys worry about stats? That's an interesting one. Uh, yes, we try to bring in stats because we're the only show on CTP, even with our stat heads, and we got a bunch of them in the group. We're the only ones to bring them to you, right, to show you some of these stats. So How did, uh, how did Cook look last week? Uh-huh. So it's that's why. Um, Quang asked, why does Zimmer draft cornerbacks when he can find quarter? Oh, why does he always draft cornerbacks when he can find cornerbacks to 7 11? No, last year proved he can't. Um, <laughs> Nobody can. <laughs> uh, once, once you're getting to the bottom of the barrel, yeah. there ain't no diamonds in the There's, rough. Um, Jason. Russ Cook, I uh, think that is the concurrence among both of us and most people watching. So, any last bits on this course. before we move on to the next question? Well, I did, did no, just because uh, the the question of whether will Cook play, and I said I don't think Zimmer <laughs> agrees with me, is kind of tied into one of the other topics that we that we have. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, all right, now we get to the next one. You asked, is Anthony Barr better than Vigil? But people well, are my, saying Nick my... Vigil should continue to play if Anthony Barr is ready to play. Double D joins us. How you doing, Doink? Double Doink, yeah. I can't read any of those PFF stats because I don't have my glasses on. I'm simple, <laughs> well, go by I'm the colors. That... You got to remember, the darker the color, the greens, the blue is good. The yellows, browns, and reds are bad. Yeah, so we're oh. seeing a lot of we're seeing a lot of yellows, browns, and and reds from Vigil. Not nearly as much for Burr. Right. Uh, my yeah, the, my question was uh, was more how much of a difference is Anthony Barr going to make compared to Vigil to the Vikings defense? Because one of the things uh, that <laughs> Zimmer pointed out, and you've mentioned it too in the past, uh, a couple of shows before about when we were kind of like, well, when I was saying, I was talking about Vigil saying he's made lots of, you know, some splash plays the first couple of games. Um, I, you know, I'd hate to see Barr take snaps from him, but Zimmer was talking about, mentioning about how they haven't the Vikings haven't been able to run some of the stuff they'd like to run without Burr. Uh, so we're going to see tomorrow uh, how much different that Vikings defense is with Burr in there, if indeed he is going to play, and it sounds like he is. He wasn't on the injury report, nope. uh, and Zimmer said that Final he was going to make his, his season debut. So uh, Burr should be very fresh. He hasn't played in, about, what is it, uh, uh, 18, 19 games now? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, season and a half feels like. So, mm-hmm. I think the, the thing that's that. the thing that's going to be uh, maybe where we'll know, along with running those formations, that us uh, fans don't know what those formations are. <laughs> we don't know how much different or how much more uh, exotic the Vikings defense is going can be with Bear compared to Vigil. But one thing that has come up the past couple of weeks is that Vigil's run defense. Uh, grades have been very, very poor. Yes. And Barr is a better run defender, doesn't miss as many tackles, uh, a little bit stouter. And if the Vikings are one of, one of their big weaknesses has been run defense, the Browns exposed that last week, but every other team has as well this season. And if Barr can make a little bit of a difference there, especially with Michael Pierce not playing tomorrow, um, that I think that that's one of the keys of the game because Detroit, they don't run the ball too badly. They they don't blow you away with their running attack, but they've run effectively this year most of the time, except against the Ravens, who usually snuff out most teams' running attacks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but really, you don't want, I think against Jared Goff, you really want him facing, like a lot of quarterbacks, but particularly him, you want him facing third and long situations because he's not very, he's kind of, he's like cousins. He doesn't, he's not a, he's a drop back passer, doesn't handle pressure as well. And he's not going to take off and run, run on you for any big gains if, if you do get pressure on him. Um, so if you can keep, you can prevent Detroit from getting in the comfortable down and distance situations and Barrett can somehow help with that, that'd be a big plus for this Vikings defense because Vigil has been kind of showing up as a weak link in the run defense 
the past a few games. Mm-hmm. That's where I think I think Barr could make a, a real early impact. Uh, and we all people always bring up, well, we can also send him as a blitzer, but. Um, yeah, there's that too. He hasn't been very effective as a blitzer the past few years. Well, Chimac is the cousins of the de- Bar is the cousins of the defense. That is a great analogy because we <laughs> know Bar can do some absolutely spectacular things on the defensive side, and then he disappears for quarters or game or a game at a time, and it's just like where'd he go? You know, he's out there, but he's not doing. He's not doing anything spectacular and uh, rightly or wrongly for me that as as a fan you 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 kind of you you remember players and you also put value on players on the splash plays that that they make Mm -hmm. the game-changing plays that they make and anthony burrow has not made very many of those the past two or three seasons uh, whereas Nick Vigil uh, had a pick six mm-hmm. in, in you know in the Arizona game, that's a splash play. That was a big help to the Vikings, even if he right. And those are momentum grabbers, and yeah. that helps the team. Um, they don't they don't you know help the overall stats, but if they grab the momentum, change the outcome of the game, that is huge. And. Anthony Barr, though, has is dealing with tendonitis, is what they call it, in his knees. Uh, there's also supposedly arthritic. Um, we know what that did with uh, um, Sam Bradford. <laughs> so mm-hmm. hopefully we won't have the same thing happen with Barr. You would think he wants to be out there. He's in a contract year. We don't have him next year. Um, he's not under contract. He will be a free agent. So hopefully he tries to make up for it from here on out. I think that uh, it'll be uh, also interesting to see whether, <laughs> remember at the, the first game of the year where the Vikings uh, look very, very sloppy and rusty against the Bengals. Uh, a lot of their starters did because they hadn't played at all in the preseason, and, and we felt that that was a factor. Uh, let's see how quick Barr is to react to come back and how, and in, how instinctive he is on plays after not having played for so long. Uh, mm-hmm. He's got to be rusty too. He'll be very fresh. He'll be very healthy, but uh, you know, that, that instinctive, that quick action, recognizing things that, that you would expect players to do when they've played a lot, he's not going to have that, that game time, uh, in there and maybe that is going to be as much of a factor in how what, what kind of an impact Anthony Barr has as the fact that he's back in there and Nick Vigil is going to be playing a lot less snaps as a result kind of too bad for Blake Lynch because he's not going to play at all uh, tomorrow and I thought he kind of had a nice little he, game yeah, against he, the Bengals he was nice hopefully he gets in at least some place and at at least, least uh, makes the active he, roster and get in some yeah. place and at least special teams well, he'll be on special teams for sure. And I, the other good thing is that we know that Lynch can play a little bit. And if somebody gets dinged up like Barr, if his knee mm-hmm. uh, starts bothering him, you can put late Lynch in there and you can feel not too bad about it. Mm-hmm. Well, Quang has been very vocal today. And G-Mac He, he was vocal, in. very vocal last week. <laughs> and we're going to get to that on the next question. You wanted to talk about... Zimmer, Kubiak, and Andre Patterson. What exactly did you want to discuss? My discussion point was um, just looking at this game tomorrow is is quite similar to the situation we faced last year when we played the Falcons. We're playing a team that doesn't have a win yet in the season, we uh, we're playing them at home. We're heavily favored. Uh, it's an important game for us to keep any keep in the divisional title race at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we last year when the Vikings had the opportunity, they had the Falcons coming in 0 and 5 team. We were 1 and 4, uh, coming off uh, a tough loss against Seattle, but really needed this game. And we laid an absolute egg in it turnovers we couldn't stop the falcons at all i got way behind and and then put up a bunch of garbage stats at the end to make the score look a little bit respectable but Mm -hmm. you know last year when that happened 
Vikings fans, in, including me, you, we were pretty irate with the performance. Uh, oh, yes. There was a lot of there was a lot of questions about fire Zimmer. He's got to go. Well, uh, and it's, we it's a that game that Kirk happen. Cousins came out with multiple interceptions, and it was yeah. just like, what is wrong with this team? Uh, our buddy Drew was screaming, "Why can't they coach him up?" Blah blah blah, and it was bad. You were right. Atlanta was bad. And can this one, and you're worried about, can this one be the same thing? I don't see the, the like, the D- Detroit uh, blowing us out like Atlanta did. But I do feel that, a, like, a, to me, if you lost this game, mm-hmm. uh, a game like this, to an un, un, a team with no wins for the second straight year, and it, that basically your season's done at this point because if you look at the Vikings' schedule after this, try to try to count the wins that the games that you think that the Vikings would be favored in. There's not a whole lot of them. Right. Gonna have Maybe to one. Really, yeah. yeah like Until Detroit again, we meet Detroit, Detroit again. again. Yeah. yeah. Like we're going to be the underdogs and we're going to have to play significantly better than we're playing now to win the amount of games we'd need to play, uh, the amount of games we'd need to win to get in the playoff situation. At, at this, at that point, if you're looking at two lost seasons, nothing has really changed. We brought in a whole bunch of new talent, particularly on defense. It's older talent, but we brought it, brought it in. Mm-hmm. And you lose at home to a team with no wins for the second straight year. To me, if I'm the owner, I'd be kind of saying, well, you know, this isn't getting any better. Time to change. Uh, and, it, and it gives me an opportunity as an owner to think about uh, get an early look at all the potential coaching uh, coaching candidates that I can hire and really do a lot of research on them early by getting rid of Zimmer. Well, maybe um, he, they may be looking for a GM to hire. Well, that that's coach. yeah. But like Andrew was saying, I think I, I think I agree with his comment. I don't think the the Wills are pretty patient owners. You can say a lot about them, but they're pretty patient. I don't think oh, a very. loss tomorrow. I don't think a loss tomorrow is going to cost Zimmer the job, even as bad as it could be. And part of the reason of that is that Mid-season. if they fire, if they fire Zimmer, uh, who who replaces them? Who on this staff would you put in as the interim head coach to make sure things don't go like horribly horribly wrong? Clint Kubiak's in his first year as offensive coordinator. We're not too sure about how good he is. Uh, Patterson's assistant defensive coordinator with Adam Zimmer. Uh, he's never re- really had as this is the highest he's had as far as responsibility of coaching. Well, he's uh, been an assistant head coach for the last couple of years. He's the logical. Whatever, whatever that means. Right. Well, probably Zim probably pushed off some of the paperwork. A um, trash can could replace <laughs> Zim Quanks. <laughs> Um, he's the logical one out of everybody talking. Andre Patterson is the logical one. He's been around forever. He knows how the league works. He has been assistant head coach. Um, he could easily step in. There's been some talk of, well, do you try the offensive wonder kid, even though he has less than a year at OC on his belt? They went from previous administration went from Denny Green to Mike Tice. Am I missing? No. Yeah. No. Denny Green to Mike Tice, and they took Mike Tice from line coach to head coach, right? And they skipped the whole OC process. Yeah. And Mike Tice, for all his faults, and he had plenty, I thought was a decent head coach. Um, He Obviously had growing pains and then uh, the whole love boat and uh, selling tickets and the uh, whole, all his faults. But uh, Brad Childress yeah, the, is available. No, Brad, Brad, not Brad Childress. Um, GMAC, speaking of Brad Childress, you got to go way back machine to Loof's locker room and you can see how I respected that man. Anyways. <laughs> I did, yeah. The the Tice was uh, Tice. Uh, when you look back on his time there, and like some of the bonehead stuff that he did, but uh, he also never had a, a terrible amount of, of uh, talent, particularly on the defensive Nor side. Nor support of the ball. from his owner. No, not from the owner. And uh, yeah, they used to. They had like the the we gone like they had like the the fewest 
uh, coaching staff of anybody mm-hmm. in the NFL. Like they had a Loney was the offensive line coach and the offensive coordinator, and it was all like McCombs was just skin flinting big yeah, time. Yeah, and that the point. ice machine and Winter Park broke yeah. down, and Tice had to bring in ice from the Seven Eleven and the whole works. Yeah, yeah, it was bad. So. So considering, uh, you know, when you look on, back on it now, it was all maybe it's kind of amazing that the Vikings were competitive as they were with 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 Dice, but not a Chili fan. Uh, neither is this guy, uh, G Mac. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> but I yeah I did. I, to me, a uh, loss tomorrow would be something where you'd you'd be time to let's let's yes, double D. you know let's uh, enough. You know, we've mm-hmm. got uh, right. the things aren't going to improve. Let's start from scratch and get an early start on picking the new head coach. It ain't getting any better, but the, the mm-hmm. Wilfs are not going to do that unless now, it was uh, some 60 to nothing loss to the Lions, which is not going to happen. That's either. not going to happen. Now, if they're one in five by the bye, there's probably a head that's going to roll. It's probably Zimmers, but very well could be Spielman. Could be in the mix at the end. Spielman's generally got the Wilfs bamboozled. I don't know why he's been here since 2006. And uh, <laughs> he's got a lot of history behind two, him. Two conference championships in those, what, 16 mm-hmm. seasons? Yep, that's, that's, that's it. And, and one of them we got blown out in. Mm-hmm. So um, it literally could be they all could go all being Zimmer and staff Spielman and Kirk Cousins next year. If they don't want to pay him, they could bring in a new GM who wants to find the new coach who wants to find a new quarterback, yada, yada, yada. And if that does happen, then the question comes, do you put in the young guys, right? Do you see what you have with Kellen Mond? Kellen Mond was a Work project, we knew when he drafted. He had to work on his mechanics, get him reprogrammed, and do all that. He's the only rookie that I'm aware of that hadn't played, you know, in the first three rounds, quarterback-wise. Um, and it's, they purposely said he's a project. And being drafted in the third round, you have less than a 20% chance of being anywhere decent in the league. Um, is it time to put him in? And then if you win games, say you put Clint Kubiak, offensive guy and say hey go at it see what you can win and then you know if you lose a bunch you're improving your draft position for the next guy that's going to be hired Hmm. to come in you know and whatever but we're not quite to that point no we're not yeah we're not we're not that would be much later uh, like if you're one and eight or one and nine i don't want to see him on in, in the game at all uh this season unless uh, well, I don't know if I'd prefer, I'd probably prefer him over Mannion, but I, I don't think Mond is ready to take a snap in an NFL game from what I saw in the preseason. Uh, I hope he's just uh, on the uh, bench and on the sideline and soaking up all the knowledge he can from whoever the hell is teaching him stuff. Andrew asks, is the way of the future the Ravens and Chiefs Bills model? If Does he mean. Be- Quarterback wise or team construction wise? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Because the Bills' quarterback's different than the the mobile quarterback, per se. I Um, just don't anything special in mind who that dude said. Yeah, I would, from what I saw in the preseason, I would agree with that. He didn't look uh, like a guy who's, um, you know, he didn't show like anything spectacular and he looked god really downright awful uh-huh. <laughs> in 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 two of the games uh, things improved a bit in the second half against Kansas City but uh, yeah no mon's got a lot of work to do to be yeah. a uh, competent NFL quarterback and maybe with two years that happens but if i were the vikings i wouldn't be uh, i'd be looking up my uh, qb uh, prospects in the next draft or two as well Mm-hmm. Because, uh, yeah, the, like you say, the, the, the bond, the 20% chance in the third round, those aren't great odds either. <laughs> yes, GMAC, that's true. <laughs> um, Cam Newton's still out there. Cam swashed. Sorry. Um, moving think, on. Yeah, Newton would be kind of like a Donovan McNabb move. Yeah, I, I, almost exactly. Donovan won all those 
got to the, all those NFC championships and then got here and threw torpedo balls. Um, <laughs> moving on to the next one. You wanted to talk about Romeo Aquara and his sacks versus Everson Griffin and his sacks. Well, I'm just happy that, uh, I, yeah, I wanted to note that, you know, this is kind of like it goes to the the the, the Lions <laughs> defense, Warren Moon, yeah. Yeah, maybe at 50, 50, whatever, Warren might still be able to. He do came in than... late. Brett came yeah. in late, had a good year. But I, I guess, yeah, I just feel that uh, with, with Aquara, he's got the Achilles tear, so he's out for the year. And that he was really, he's really the only guy, even though he had just the one sack this year for the Lions, but he was there. He's their top pass rusher him and Trey Flowers, and Flowers is questionable for the game tomorrow, and he might not be playing either. But Aquara being out, really, that really cuts down. If you look at the, the Lions' defense, the, uh, there's not a whole lot of guys that you would recognize there. Michael Brockers is kind of a run stuffer, uh, more of a run D guy. He doesn't have much of a pass rush. Uh, Flowers, if he doesn't play, even if he does play, he's not a huge, hasn't been a huge, huge help to the Lions. They got rid of Jamie Collins. He's now with the Patriots. Aqua is out for the season. Really, uh, they, they, you know, the Lions, so the, the pass rush, they're not going to be able to get after the passer. Uh, and that is very important for the Vikings offense because when we, as we've seen, the Vikings offensive line is going to struggle against really good front sevens, really good defensive lines. Mm-hmm. The Lions do not have that which means that Kirk Cousins should have a, a much more time to throw than he had last week, which means he should do a pretty good job of carving up the Lions' defense just like he has throughout his career. Uh, he's got Keyword crazy in that numbers. sentence, should. Should, yes, yes. But he's gotten, what, he's thrown 15 touchdown passes and had one interception against the Lions in, in, his, you know, in the eight games that he's uh, played against them. Uh that's a big one uh on the other side um the sack daddy everson griffin i've been pleasantly surprised with his play Mm -hmm. and he is starting to uh uh, they had you know they had um why can't i even remember his name now (laughs) yeah you know yeah dj wanham he was a starter and he's still starting but Basically, Griffin is eating into his into his snaps big time the past couple of games and providing a lot more pass rush than Wanham has has ever done. And uh, I am, um, you know, it's not great that we're depending on a 34 year old as as to be I one of know. our top it's two not... pass rushers. But uh, for this year, I'm happy about it. I'm expecting the sack daddy to uh, get even more snaps than he has been getting, and that. He is going to uh, be another factor tomorrow against the Lions, who've got a real beat-up offensive line. Taylor Decker hasn't played all season, I don't think. Uh, Frank Ragnow, their starting well, we'll guard, he's put, put, put on the injured injured reserve. And uh, Penny Suell, it doesn't look like he is going to play either. He's questionable with an ankle. And also yeah. throw in TJ Hawkinson, their tight end, who's also questionable with a knee injury. That'd be a big loss for them because he's their top pass catcher with 22 catches this year. He's really the, the rest of the guys they got: uh, Quintez Cephas, Khalif Raymond, uh, Amon Ra, Saint Brown are all very young guys in their first and second years and haven't shown a lot yet. Uh, how do you feel about Breland? But it, Hawkinson is the guy that they go to the most, and if he can't play tomorrow, I think he will play. Uh, but if he can't play tomorrow, that's another huge loss for the Lions. Uh, it, if he wasn't out, you kind of get start to thinking, how are they going to move the ball at all? Um, I did uh, one thing. I don't know if anybody watched the, the Bears-Lions game last week. Uh, I did watch the condensed version uh, this okay. morning just to, to kind of kind of see how things goes. And, and um, it, the Lions are, you know, I, I – at the beginning of the show, I said the Lions aren't the 76 Tampa Bay Buccaneers who were just flat horrible. out awful, mm-hmm. horrible, probably the worst team that's ever ever played in the NFL. But the Lions have, you know, they, they don't do anything well, which is why they're 0-4. But 
uh, last week against the Bears and the Bears defense, I think most of us would feel, feel that the Bears defense is tougher than the Vikings defense. The the Lions really, I counted, the Lions had, like, they had a shot in that game. They, they had their first three offensive drives. They got inside the 10-yard line and they got zero points out of it. Uh, they had one, the, the first one, there was a, a like a the center s- snapped it when when Jared Goff was trying to change protection and mm-hmm. bounced off his knee and went right into Bilal Nichols' hands. Uh, zero. The, the next time they went down, they went for it on fourth and one, didn't make it. And then the third time they were inside the 10 and there was a strip sack by Robert Quinn that the Bears recovered. So their first three drives, they could have gotten at least nine points, possibly 21 points, and they got zero. And the, even the fourth quarter, their last, their second last drive, they got inside the 10 again, didn't get any points off of that. They went for, for fourth and one. Now they were down 24 to 14 at the time. But uh, so they made a, a business decision on when they were going to get the points. But I guess the point is here is that the Lions did move the ball on, on the Bears last week. And if not for some, in some cases, bad luck, mm-hmm. they may have, may have won that game. And they certainly... So they didn't look like a team that has no shot of of giving you problems. Um, Jared Goff has got the same completion, pretty much the same completion percentage as Kirk Cousins right now. They've thrown for about the same amount of passing yards. He's got two less touchdown passes and has thrown one one more interception. But but basically the stats are pretty even that way. Detroit's saw uh, wide receivers aren't at the caliber that the Vikings top two are, mm-hmm. but, or even but they run. The, yeah. But they, Deandre Swift, Jamal Williams are not bad running backs. They do have an offense yes. that if they, if they can give Garrett, Jared Goff time with some of the issues we have seen with the Vikings past defense, this might, might not be the easy win that'll some Vikings fans think it will be. Uh, there should be no question that we can move the ball on the defense on the Lions defense, but where it's the, where I think if things are really going to come down to is can the Vikings defense stop the Lions offense from doing what they did last week? Can they create a couple of a few turnovers, which they have not done? We've only right. had two turnovers this season. Like those are the things that are going to turn the game. Um, and can they get after Jared Goff with a very uh, undermanned offensive line that the Lions have right now. Those are kind of the big things that are, I think are going to determine uh, whether the Vikings go one and four or if they go two and three. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with you. Uh, Vegas thinks they will be able to do that. Uh, the present line went up to 10 point favorites for the Vikings, which scares me. It, um, yeah, it does. And there was a, there was a write-up by uh, um, Mike Tanier, who writes for Football Outsiders. Uh, some of us who frequent that mm-hmm. site are quite familiar with his work. But he did kind of a he did a like a game preview of he does a game preview of all of the games. But his his preview of the Vikings and the Lions. He basically I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, but he he, he said uh, the the Vikings are a medio- mediocre aging team that's not good at the things that it thinks it's good at. It's not, they're not. They're not shrewd game managers. They don't make good in-game decisions. And uh, he says, and he also, and he said something along the lines of that. Uh, and they, uh, they are more than likely to. They have a ha- habit of stepping on every, every uh, field rake <laughs> on on their lawn. Uh-huh. And and that that is good that analogy. is like that is like to a T what the Vikings have done mm-hmm. to start this season all these goofy things that happen to them like like Sheldon Richardson calling a timeout on a, on an extra point when they didn't have a timeout left uh, I don't think well, that would have mattered you know why he did because, that oh I know why he did it because There's we 12 had minutes too on many the field. guys on the field yeah mm-hmm. so either way we were hooped <laughs> they would have got the five you know the, right. the, the penalty and and got the chance to to have the decision and, of whether and, to go for two or not and the but whole it's 12 just, men on the field is almost an inexcusable penalty, right? It's almost an inexcusable brain fart because they drill every single week of if so-and-so's hurt, who's on 
the special team, whatever it is, right? Field goal defense, right? Who's on it, right? And they go, so and so's hurt. Who's in there? And if the backup, you know, is say Armand Watts, he's go, I am, right? Mm -hmm. And they drill that all the time during the week because that is so important. And then you get out there in game day and just totally brain fart it. Hey, I'm supposed to be out there. But wait a minute. My guy <laughs> isn't hurt. What? Oh, wait a minute. You know, and it's it's one of those things. Discipline. Well, that was, that's, it's those, it's that's those kind it of like it's in, a, in a game like against in the Browns game, that those kind of small plays made a huge difference. That, that one extra point and then giving up the 33-yard run on on third and 20, mm -hmm. those four extra points, now you don't know what how things would have been different in the second right. half, but take away those two plays and those four points that the Browns got, the Vikings are coming down at the end of the game with a chance to kick a field goal to win the fucking game. To win the fucking, yes. Yeah. Which is the purpose we play the game, to win the fucking game. Yes. But it's just, yeah, like whether, whether you have Cook fumbling on when you're driving in overtime for the winning field goal or you have Joseph missing the last second field goal to win the game, just those plays just keep on, have just been happening all the time to the Vikings this season and a lot of times last season too in the close games uh, that we lost. You know, unbelievable. Talk, curse. Unbelievable the, the crap that we, we've been pulling off or not the pulling off. Different curses. Now that comes down to discipline. Who is probably the most disciplinary coach? I shouldn't say most. That could have been, uh, what's his face? The Marine, ex-Marine. He was an ex. Les Steckel. Les Steckel. But probably the most disciplinary coach before that, demanded it and got it, was Sir well, Bud Grant, Bud Gr period. Bud Grant, yeah. Stand I mean, a, you got to you got to stand a certain way for the national anthem. Exactly. And everybody's got to have their toes. <laughs> you got to look a certain way. Can't wear gloves. Can't you know all that? And it was and it worked. And who's the last one to bring us to a Super Bowl? Bud Grant. So there's something to be said about discipline when it comes to playing football. I think and no white is, shoes. No white shoes. No. Um, no just black. Double shoes, doink. Maybe. That was, yeah, back in the 70s when I was watching, you had Billy White Shoes Johnson, right, down in Houston. Um, spectacular receiver and return guy. Um, legendary. But do you know why Bud Grant refused to have his players or made sure his players didn't wear white shoes? Here's a little tidbit from way back. And no love boat. Yes, you got that right, Quang. Mm-hmm. Do you know why, Darren? I don't know why. His reasoning was that he felt his players, that the opposing team thought his players looked slower in black shoes, black cleats, and would be outrun because all it was was an optical um, deception on his part, that black cleats make you look like you're running slower when in actuality, the whole idea is it causes defenders to miss their angles and stuff because they're misjudging the speed. And hmm. that's the reason why he insisted on black cleats. See, there was a method to his There was a method to madness. his madness. And he thought, oh, uh, Andrew just popped in with Thielen's Turd Ferguson shoes. Um, I don't. Our I don't know what he's referring to there. I'm you, not quite you, sure either. But speaking, I know who Turd Ferguson is. But speaking of uh, color, R.I.P. Norm Macdonald, by the way. <laughs> speaking of color and how it's used in the game, uh, Adam Thielen made almost famous the use of the yellow gloves, right? And he'd run and up with the hand, and the quarterback could see it was, you know, back in 2017 could see the flash of that yellow glove, and he knew where to throw it. Why they yep. don't wear those yellow gloves, all the receivers, on every single game blows my mind because I think that's an advantage if they would use it. Wear those, 
so that when you're running a route, you're presenting a target and the QB can better see you. I think part of Russell Wilson's success um, is wearing those god-awful chartreuse green, highlighter green uniforms. He can see his teammates, right? It's the whole idea of Zimmer saying we should wear white on white when we're away. And I agree, we should wear white on white because it makes it easier to see the quarterback, to see his players. Do that. Take every advantage. If it's a color deal, take advantage of it. But it's just, it seems to be a win. Anyways, <laughs> Zim's method to get two yards closer so we could punt. Quang is not a big Zimmer fan. No, getting, well, hopefully, but this year Zimmer's going more for it on fourth down, which is interesting. Especially well, yeah, after he yeah, got yeah. hammered that last, last week. He was rated on the fourth down bot. Um, he was rated as the best QB in the league. He had one of the best decisions. Did, 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 did you have an issue with them going for it on fourth and six uh, that in the first half? Versus attempting I, the 53-yard field goal? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, thought it, I thought at the time it was 55 yards. I heard later it would have been a 53-yarder. Yeah, now, yeah obviously, I thought it was a little longer, too. Um, that was, you're testing, you're out of range, and his whole idea is, can we make it? You're nearing the dead man's land right there, oh, yeah. where it's almost too far to punt. Um, effectively, it's, just, I'd rather he go for it. I, I like the fact that he's going for it more. I like the aggressiveness that he's okaying, whether it's Clint calling it or Zim, that he's okaying the let's be more aggressive. I want to be more aggressive on offense. Let's do it. So in that respect, I'm I'm cool with that. Because like I said, I thought it was a 55 or 57 or something like that. Somebody said, no, it's a 53. And of course, Joseph's been good from the 253 so far. It's a gamble. No, I, I, I'm I not faulting him on that. If it would have no, been fourth and six and he was back on the Vikings 20 going for it, yeah, I would fault that. Now, and then you're going to punt yeah. it. But now nah, he was nearing that dead man's area of the field, so. I had no uh, no issues with it either. I, I think the only thing is that those analytics, uh, I, I and I don't know, this is where you either go all in on analytics or you don't, but uh, one of the things that you, you, you'd have to, as a coach, uh, you'd have to think about was, how is my offense performing right now against this defense? And mm -hmm. do is going for it at this point a good decision based on how we're doing against this defense that's where i think it you, you, sometimes the analytics you can't just say oh well right. it says 53 you know our chances of winning if we convert here or our whatever percentage percent yeah. percent up uh well if you've got like a one percent chance of making it because your offense can't do squad against the defense maybe you should just punt it mm -hmm. but i you know that's just something i thought about i wonder if the if the the coaches also think about that like when everybody went rah rah when Harbaugh went for it on um, against the Chiefs when they had fourth and one, right. and they were they were inside their own territory. Well, a little bit different when you got Lamar Jackson. I think if if you got Jackson, you put him in the in the shotgun with a couple of running backs next to him, and you need one yard. Even yeah. if the defense has twenty guys up at and the a line good of offensive scrimmage, line, I, yeah. I I bet that Jackson would be able to make that one yard like ninety nine percent of the time. Like that's not even a gamble. But we don't have Lamar Jackson. <laughs> this wasn't the, quite the same situation. I didn't have a, an issue with it, but I I just brought it up because I wonder again like, how I thought yeah. game like how do you, do you always make that decision if you if your def, if their defense is really kicking your ass? Uh, maybe again, yeah, maybe you no, should. No, then you play for the field positions. It's the other yeah, thing. You're the weighing other thing that. Is that. It's not the other just. Thing is that, I've, I've I've kind of felt before with this going for it with the analytics is that I think that uh, if you've got an offense and you've drilled it and you've put in a philosophy that we are going to go for it on fourth and whatever a lot this year, defense be ready for it, offense be ready for it. If you've got that philosophy and you've really drilled it, then those fourth and sixes, uh, I don't think are going to phase you. Like you're going to feel confident. I don't know if the Vikings always feel confident going for it 
on any fourth and whatever because <laughs> Zimmer really hasn't done that, Has that done it for most past? of his career. <laughs> and, you know, look who we got at quarterback. Uh, if, if things break down a little, his cousin's going to be able to sift through the garbage and Which be able to make a good brings play. us to our next topic. But I want to agree with topic? Kang. You can still like Zimmer, but if it's we're at the point it's job performance only. Um, mm-hmm. Our next topic is Kirk Cousins. And I did put up his PFF grades for this season, the four games so far. And this is what I absolutely love, and that's sarcasm, about PFF. If you look at his offensive grades and his passing grades, the ones with the color squares, people watching on their phones and their TVs can see it probably more clearly than the blind Darren Campbell without his glasses. Um, I do see they're green. Most yes, of them are they green. are green. And it, uh, the Cleveland game was the worst, but it's still in the mid-60s, and they're a lime greenish color, right? Is that... The overall score for the season is higher than any of the individual scores during the game. This, knowing people at PFF, talking to people at PFF, having PFF Eric in our group, the Climbing the Pocket group, and how they do this, this is where they take latitude and take the eyeball... What is this? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I got to ban another one. This is wonderful. Um, anyways, if you have herpes, call Dr. Oba, whatever. Um, <laughs> um, but this is where they take latitude and they bump up the, the score for what they've seen. Um, and it just... It is what it is. They like Kirk Cousins so far this season. That's why I put the red glowing so eyeballs I. of the machine. And uh, <laughs> he, he has played well, and he has <laughs> played better. Oh. <laughs> That's funny. Um, it could be. Um, <laughs> this is where <laughs> it's funny. It's better than the last spam we got. Guys, and the guys on line will get it. And that was from Facebook. Last one we got was on YouTube, and I could ban him. Um, And he got reported, by the way. Anyway. Oh, (laughs) oh, it was bad. It was hateful and stuff. Um, Yeah. But anyways, you wanted to talk about Kirk Cousins. I just popped up the PFF grades just to give us context. Yeah, I... The uh, what I wanted to say about Cousins is that I agree with every with most people this year who have been happy with how he has played. I think he's played pretty well. I think that, but I think last week showed the. I don't even blame him that much. I don't blame him at all for last week's performance. Really, I feel that when you've got like less than one second to throw the ball before the passing pockets getting caved in on you, uh, what are you going to do? The problem is that when that happens, and it happens more more often than 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 Viking fans would like, Cousins doesn't have that Kyler Murray or that Pat Mahomes or even that Baker Mayfield ability to escape from it or make a a good throw from a bad position to bail his offensive line out of those situations. And or the Tom until- Brady knowledge that if I take a half step to the left. I'm helping my offensive lineman, or if I step up, I have a, a lane to throw in. That, yeah, that that's or, one of the faults of Kirk Cousins. And over his and, career, and that's and that is never going to change. Uh, he has become maybe a with a new more... offensive-minded head coach. Maybe, uh, and maybe if maybe not. Christian Darrisaw eventually gets into the starting lineup and becomes the left tackle that we hoped uh, we hope he becomes uh, considering the potential that he has maybe that will uh, change things too although whether that will make a big difference this year I don't know we don't know when Derisaw is going to replace Rashad Hill but it's it's going to happen I think at some point in time this season 
in, in, if Derisaw can continue to stay healthy. Uh, when do you but, anticipate Derisaw coming in for him? I don't. I don't see him. Um, I think a lot of I th- I've heard some people say it'll be the week, uh, the game after the bye week. I think that might be a little quick uh, because uh, he still hasn't practiced a whole heck of a lot. Well, and uh, see, that's what gets me. I've heard, well, he's young. He probably still hasn't mastered the plays. How long have he has he been playing football? And now he's mm-hmm. a professional, right? Yes, he is. One of the first things any of us to play football at a competitive level, high school on up, right? Do is we get a playbook and the first thing we try to do is commit to memory the plays and the play calls. Now, some people take more of, well, I've got to step through each play to know it, right? I've got to know that on this play, I'm blocking down, I'm chipping. I'm trapping. I'm blocking head on. My head goes on this side. My head goes on that side. Um, I'm stepping back. My responsibility is this. If somebody comes blitzing, I help this. Whatever it is, right, for him, they learn that the basic stuff that if Kirk Cousin calls some (laughs) fictitious play, Right, something that's in the playbook, Z twenty seven right Yankee Doodle, whatever it is, right that he knows, he's already memorized because he studied that damn playbook for months. That that means, all right. First off, he's on the left side, left tackle, and his responsibility because they called a Z is to do this. And if a lineman's here, he does this, and a defensive lineman's here, he does this. If a linebacker's here, he does that, whatever. He should know that already. I have a hard time saying that, oh, he's a rookie. He hasn't had to practice. He doesn't know it all. He may not have it all committed to muscle memory yet, to where it's subconscious, right? But he should know by now. We pay him, even as a rookie, enough money that he should know this. He has spent enough time sitting in the tub trying to get healthy that, you know, if you're in the tub, have that playbook right there. Any rookie should have that playbook with him. You know, if they're a ball carrier, they should have the ball. But on the other hand, they should have the playbook. They should be getting all that stuff. But I'm old school, so, hey. I don't think that it's. I don't think it's the plays, the, the knowledge of the plays that that worries me with Derisaw. It's it's just the fact that the the reps he's getting against <laughs> NFL players G-Mac. and and being able to. G Max had some real good zingers today, by the way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, but uh, but I yeah I don't like Derisaw when if his first game is coming back. I think after the bye we play the Cowboys. Uh, Halloween be, baby Halloween. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's just uh, if you haven't if he didn't get to play in preseason against guys coming at him and giving him the club move and the bull rush and the spin move and all these sorts of things, uh, and he's only really been practicing full time for three weeks, uh, I just kind of wonder if uh, and we and offensive linemen have uh, tend to struggle in their first year anyway. We've seen uh, I do, like I just kind of I I feel I don't know I feel he needs more seasoning in whatever possible way part of the part of getting more seasoning is actually playing in the games uh but then that uh those games actually count <laughs> in, in which case if he's getting beat badly uh then that could really hurt us but on the other hand how much worse beat, is he getting beat than rashad hill yeah is the yeah question. that's the thing right uh, and if hill has been hill has been, hill, hill has been very bad against cincinnati very bad against the browns he was meh the other two games Right. And so, if maybe. if we take the unfortunate route and do horribly over the next two games, he needs to start. He needs to get his playing times, period. See what the young kids can do. Pardon me. Stick him in there and let's go. Um, what could happen is that somehow Hill gets hurt, can't play, 
and then Derisaw gets in there and he doesn't give the job back. That's what happened with that Brian would O'Neill. Be sweet. And, that's what happened with Brian O'Neill in 2018, and that's what we might. I mean, that might be, be his quickest him, path but... to getting on the field. Who knows? Who knows? Because, mm, All right, we, we've gone through your list items, long items for this show of what to talk about. There's one thing left. How do you think the Vikings are going to do tomorrow? And what's your score prediction? Well, uh, I'm a little bit sheepish to give a score because I think um, my prediction last week was not only wrong. It was not only wrong, but I think I, what did I, I said the Vikings would win 34 to 28 uh, and they ended up losing 14 to 7. Why isn't Wyatt Davis starting? Good question, Double Doink. Who everybody's been asking. Well, that it's because Oliudo has been playing all except for last better. week. Very, very good. I think that I see the Vikings winning tomorrow. I don't think it's going to be, though, it's not going to be the, the easy win that people are, are predicting just because I'm still not sold on the defense. Uh, an optimist would look at it and say, well, they've only given up seven points in the last. Um, They've only given up 14 points in the last six quarters they've played. But uh, I've got to see more from the Vikings defense before I buy in on this new improved team. And one of the reasons I think they, they played a little bit better lately is that Cameron Dantzler has been playing, and he's not going to be playing tomorrow. We're going to have Freeland out there again. Um, so the, there you go. That, 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 I, don't th- I think that's more of a loss than getting Bar back is more of a, more of a gain. Um, but I, I think that the Vikings will win. I think it'll be, uh, I'm going to go 31-24 for the Vikings. Okay. It's not bad. And I think I called on some... Wednesday 35-14. That was a bigger spread because they should. Now the question is, will they? And Zimmer is always good against the spread. He's one of the best coaches against the spread ever. But 10-point spread scares the shit out of me. Um yeah, I was. I was. And uh, a knowing bit surprised. this team, I was a bit surprised when I looked at watched the condensed game, uh, the Lions Bears game this morning. Like how uh, well that how well that the Lions moved the ball on the Bears defense, who again, you uh, I think have a better defense than the Vikings, and have had a better defense, and they still, um, you know, again, if Detroit hadn't have made some dumb made some bad plays if they hadn't had a little bit of bad luck they win that game 28 to 24 um so well, if they can on, move the ball on the bears at home the when, they're, when they're playing the bears at home with that noisy crowd at soldier field um how are they going to do on the road again against uh, vikings defense which isn't as good as the bears i think uh with a noisy uh home crowd against them mm-hmm. have we stopped a running back yet the answer is no, no, GMAC. No. Anyways, I need to wind this up. Merlin, who's camera shy, I'm trying to get him in the camera. Oh. Needs to go out. You can see his paw. The guy. The guy's Merlin's so damn big it's hard to believe you couldn't get him in the camera. Well, he's camera shy. Let me see if I can turn it. There he oh. is. Come here, Merlin. Come here, buddy. Merlin. See, well, he goes away when it. I turn the camera. Oh. Merlin's my great owner, dad, by the way. Good thing his owner things. isn't camera shy. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Um, anyways, any last words before we close this up? We've already rolled over an hour. No, that's it, Dave. Uh, I just to hopefully the Vikings get can get a win so we can make next week's game against Carolina, which is going to be difficult to mean something. If and next Vikings week go feel better. And, yeah. And if, and if the Vikings go one and four and they're going into Carolina, you know, I don't know. I just season's done. Might as mm-hmm. well just start looking at what the draft position is going to be. Well, everybody, Feel free to like, subscribe, ring the bell. I'm sure most of you already have. And invite all your Vikings friends to watch uh, the whole Climb in the Pocket Network. We have um, not only us, the two old guys, on Saturday going over to pregame, but we have the whole group. We start right before the final whistle. We're live with the first 
post-game show of anybody in the Viking sphere. And we go on from there. We have a whole week lined up. Uh, you know, we had Doogie lined up. Doogie had to back out. Well, looks like maybe this week we get Doogie back. So keep your fingers crossed, as Double Doink says. And I want to thank everybody. Double Doink, G-Mac, Quang, Who's Dat, Mary, of course, Andrew. You guys have been wonderful. Uh, Jason, anybody I've missed today, I apologize. We try to get you guys involved because you mean the world to us. And so do the Vikings. Hopefully, <laughs> let's get a win. And and just to remind everybody up there, like watch out for herpes. That's right. <laughs> watch out for herpes. Everybody have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Enjoy your weekend. Good food, good Skull beverage. Baby. And Skull Vikings! Canadian Thanksgiving this weekend, too. That's right. Have a good one. Thank you for watching or listening. As always, if you like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. And if you're listening to the podcast, please rate us on your favorite aggregator. Skull, everybody.